You're listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, winner of the Share Care Emmy Award for Social Storytelling and the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today we are going to be talking with somebody that I have actually heard interviewed by my friend Pete McCall. And Pete McCall has podcasts, all about fitness podcast. Pete's been on this podcast before. I was just recently on his podcast. And as I even got a shout out uh, on the podcast that he did with this person that we have on today. So she is the associate professor of history, or A, probably not D, but an associate professor of history at the New School in New York City. And she is the author of Fit Nation, The Gains and Pains of America's Fitness Obsession. Welcome my guest, Natalia Petrozella. Hi. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to have you here. And, and it's always nice listening to Pete's podcast and and you were on it. I got a shout out in that episode. So Pete gets a shout out in this episode. Hi, Pete, who I've never met in person, but we've like talked online for years and years. Maybe one of these could, days. Oh, <laughs> y'all were like old friends. I could tell by the podcast. I was totally. like, uh, they know each other for yeah. ages. <laughs> so uh, I'm so happy to have you here. And I have to say that while I was listening to that podcast, I... I uh, Every time you spoke, I was like, I have to get her on the podcast. Oh. I have to get her on the podcast. And the reason, like, I think you're great. You're super engaging, your energy, but also the content, like what you're talking about. I mean, we are personal trainers here. So the people mm -hmm. listening to the show are personal trainers or fitness professionals or fitness professional adjacent. Like, I'm not there, but I like pretending. Like, I want to be in the know. Yeah. And so when I was hearing this, I was like, man, there's this beautiful history of exercise and fitness and kind of shines a light on some of the obsession around it. And I feel like that obsession has grown uh, almost stratospherically in the past uh, decade or so. So let's just, uh, I'm going to let you like kind of take the reins for a little bit, but like tell us a little bit about yourself and then what led you to write this book. Yeah, and I'm so excited to be here. I mean, I have such huge respect for fitness professionals. I, as a group fitness instructor and a total gym rat, I like like to think that I'm part of this crowd, but it's always you an honor are. to get to talk to publics like this. So, you know, I came to this work because I think maybe unlike a lot of your listeners and maybe like you, like I was not into sports or dance or really anything physical at all growing up. And then I was so humiliated in PE class that I found oh, no. out you could do an independent study in phys ed and I was like literally anything not to have to do like the rope climb or whatever the heck we were doing and I went to the gym it was a community center that had group fitness classes and I should say because the activity had to be supervised and my parents were like well they said you could do personal training like what's that that's for rich people that was 1994 okay and, then, wow. and they were like but you could do this thing called group fitness at this community okay. center we belong to I'm like whatever better than PE like I'm just gonna go so I walk in and it's step aerobics and like mm -hmm. you know it's a little weird but I was like within a couple classes because I had to go to get the credit I'm like oh my god I don't know what this is but I love it like I had never felt so good in my body it put me in a better mood like it was just great and so from there on out, I kind of had these like two parts of my life where I was this total gym rat when I went to college. I like worked the front desk at gym so I could get a free membership, moved out to oh, California yeah. for grad school. I like ran my first marathon. Like I just really loved that world. But, you know, I was also getting a PhD in history. And what I kind of realized is that like these two realms of like body and mind, like don't need to be so disconnected, certainly in my own here, life, here. you know? And so I, and I also realized like, you know, as a historian, I'm like, we have this very rich history of like sport. You know, you could read 20 books on the history of football or basketball or tennis, whatever. But the history of like the gym, you have some stuff about like bodybuilding, weightlifting, like mostly right. just sort of like nostalgia books, but kind of like how did the gym come to be this huge industry and such a big part of our culture? Like, I want to understand that. So that's really how I started cool. to come to this topic. Yeah. Well, listen, I feel like that prolif proliferated with the Arnold 
the era where the, mm -hmm. the it was like bodybuilding, but like, where did they get theirs from? Totally. Right? <laughs> so yeah, definitely like the pumping iron era in the seventies was a huge turning point in terms of like bringing like the gym into you know, popular consciousness. What's kind of interesting about that moment is that, yeah, like definitely Arnold helped mainstream the idea of weightlifting and going to the gym. But on the other hand, like, you know, people kind of looked like that. I looked at that group of people as like a little bit like a freak show, you know, like these big, huge dudes and they look so different. And then the shows and, you know, obviously bodybuilding changes a lot in the eighties and nineties. Like, you know, so they were yeah. so responsible for making weightlifting more mainstream, but in some ways the bodybuilding world becomes more extreme and the parts of the fitness industry that become more popular are actually like, I'm sure you've heard lots of people come to the gym and they're like, well, I don't want to look like a bodybuilder. Right. right. So it's, this interesting thing. So, but it goes back way further than that. So, you know, my book- Take us. <laughs> yeah, let's start. So my book actually starts in 1893 at the World's Fair. And it starts oh. with this guy, Eugene Sandow, who's this famous, um, you know, strength training enthusiast posing on stage in front of like a packed house every night, like every night, 6,000 people would fill this theater. And I start there because, you know, he was really important in kind of like celebrating the idea that like everybody should exercise and that to be like a full person, you should also be training. But it's really important that he was seen as kind of like a freak of nature. Like people lined up to see him, not because they wanted to be like him, but they were like, can I touch your muscles? Like, look at those rippling abs. Like, you know, you know, and they would want to like touch this no, living statue. I get it all the time. <laughs> Me too. It's, it's really hard. But the funny thing, the funny, like, and so, you know, guy, he was a little sort of like higher class in certain ways, but these strong men would basically be in the circus with like bearded ladies, Siamese <clears> twins. Like nobody was like, I should do that. They were like, let me go look at these freaks who do that. And I should say like, you know, the the appearance of his body, like, yes, he was really cut and all that, but he doesn't look that different from like a guy you would see like lifting seriously at like Equinox today. And so the 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 like bodies of Americans have changed a lot. So anyway, I kind of start there. And then my big story is like how we got from Eugene Sandow, who really he and like the other guys like him, they had to do so much work to convince Americans like working on your body is actually good. It doesn't make you like narcissistic or a pervert or a weirdo. If you're a woman, like your uterus won't fall out. Like exercise is good for you. Seriously, these are like all things that were believed. How do we get from there to today when, when I was telling people I'm working on a book about exercise culture, like almost everybody was like, I'm so bad. I need to work out today. And I'm like, that like feeling of guilt is like a relatively new construction. Like but no one felt that way in Sandow's years. And so I talk about how that happened. <laughs> and the basic story there is that like, uh, exercise goes from being thought of as like this very narrow, like physical pursuit that's for like narcissistic people or who people are too into their bodies to today, this like wellness moment when pretty much everyone agrees, yes, exercise is physically good for you, but it's also good for mental health. It's also good for community. Yeah. It's also good for like mindfulness. And so I trace that story, but I also trace, I think in some ways what's a sadder story, which is that there were a few moments in, the, in history when I think we really missed an opportunity to have like a free and accessible public fitness culture. And we don't really have that. Like PE is underfunded. Mm. A lot of kids really hate it quite honestly. And what we have is this huge industry, which has grown and become more inclusive, but it's definitely still a space where like, if you can't kind of pay to participate, um, you know, you, you don't have access to a lot of what people who have more means do. So yeah, it kind of yeah. operates on those two tracks with lots of like, I think really interesting human stories along the way. All right. So first of all, ladies and gentlemen, this is the NASMCPT podcast. I'm your host, Rick Ritchie, and we have Natalia Petrozella with us talking about what she's talked about in her book, Fit Nation, which I have purchased and I've also listened to the podcast that you did with Pete, So, uh, which, which brought me to this moment. So I want to ask a question about my favorite historical figure, which isn't too long ago, but 
Jack LaLanne. Yes. So do you have anything about Jack LaLanne in your book? I have a lot about Jack LaLanne. Oh. Jack LaLanne is a through line. Um, I love him <laughs> I too. I mean, so I mean, do you want much. me to talk a little bit about him? Why I so want great? you to talk as much as you want to about him. So Jack LaLanne, I would say when people are like, who are like the people who made yeah. working out an American pastime? And I would say Jack LaLanne is so important. So he's kind of like Forrest Gump of fitness. He's like everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can think he start. I mean, his personal story, which he tells a million times in a million different ways, is that he was like really sickly and frail and like he had a terrible diet. He ate too much sugar and he says it made me psychotic. He goes to this nutrition seminar with his mom. He meets this guy, Paul Bragg. Again, is this story exactly true? You can't fact check it, but he's told it a lot of times. And basically um, this guy who's this like health reformer, um, kind of like almost like charismatic leader, basically like instills in him that if he doesn't change his ways, he's going to die and that it takes willpower and commitment and that exercise and resisting rich foods are the way for him to like build a better body, a stronger body and a better life. So that's kind of like where he takes off. And then he becomes, I mean, he's one of the first people to try to open a gym in the 1930s. He opens his first gym in 1936 in Oakland. He has to get a blacksmith to make the equipment because like, no, there's no commercial fitness equipment industry. Yeah, that yeah. Very few people come like doctors are saying like, oh my God, you're going to get hemorrhoids if you exercise. Don't go to that place. <laughs> He's basically holding kind of training sessions. He has some wrestling teams who show up. He says later that like, because gyms were considered such sketchy places, like, you know, he did some body work, like massage and like people would come and like think that it was like a sex parlor, basically. Like it was like when right. gyms were really considered like sleazy. So anyway, he becomes a big figure at Muscle Beach, which is like before Arnold and all these folks, Muscle Beach was in Santa Monica, um, opened in the 30s. He's like posing and he becomes sort of one of the most like prominent figures of this kind of muscle culture early on. Um, he then, this is like really why a lot of people remember him. In the early 1950s, he says, well, I want to make a TV show. And it was very common that like right. entertainment folks would like go to Muscle Beach to cast extras in movies, et cetera. And he says, no, I want to make a TV show, but it's not like just going to have me, this strong man in it. I'm going to get people to exercise with me, women. And like all the studio executives are like, what are you talking about? Uh -huh. Nobody wants to watch exercise. No one wants to do exercise. Right. right. And he's like, oh, just watch. And then he starts this program, which ends up running for like over 30 years. It's called the Jack LaLanne show. And it is so wow. important because he's like the first one to basically like define almost like exercise as me time. Like you should hear. He's like, ladies. Yeah. Set aside your ironing, your washing. This time is for you. Grab a chair. And he has them do like pretty light exercises, but like it's so interesting. And like it really is the beginning of, I think, like today when you would be like, oh, I'm like, you know, dropping off my kids and then going to go to a spin class or whatever. Like that idea that exercise is part of your day. The flip side of it, which I think is just as interesting and not like as positive, is like, it hmm. also introduces exercise as like part of this to-do list, which is along with your ironing and your laundry and you're taking care of your kids. And so, you know, I watched like every episode of Jack LaLanne and there is this like dark Amazing. undertone where he's basically like, oh, you're tired. You have big hips. You have no one to blame but yourself. If you just exercise oh. with me every day, you too could live forever. But the power is with your hands. And if you just sit there and watch me rather than do it, like, Sorry. So you see kind of like, it's like really a double-edged sword. It's, okay, um, it is. He's, he's amazing in popularizing exercise. I would say on balance, I'm a fan. But you also see the introduction of like that thing I said to you, like how everyone tells me like, oh my God, I'm so bad. I need to work out. I'm like, I'm not the police. Right. He was kind right. of part of that <laughs> early generation to be like, you should be working out. And if you are not happy with your body, it's on you. So I think he's super interesting for that reason. So this is interesting too, because then we see because what here's the thing that people do they find things to separate them from others right and so we we want to find a uniqueness about ourselves we want to find something that 
oh, maybe I don't have enough money, but at least I take care of my, at least I do this. And that's why fitness professionals in, in large part are okay with not being the richest kids in the room because they're like, it doesn't matter. You still want to be me. Right? So, interesting. so yeah. when you see this, like, I wonder as, as this progresses, it, is that part of the cleavage between creating this culture of, well, I do it and I created the discipline and I did that and you didn't. Oh my gosh. That's so like intelligent the way you just said that, because absolutely like you, one of the things that's really interesting. So early on in like the days of Sandow for a couple more decades, mm -hmm. like an attractive body was kind of fat. Like you had roles, you had, you know, you looked like you had leisure and you looked like you had access uh... to rich food because few people did. Like if you looked slim and you could see your muscles, that probably meant you had a job like doing physical labor and that's not aspirational, right? You look like you couldn't afford rich food. Fascinating. The, yeah. By the time you get to the 50s, 60s, 70s, like actually what you're talking about is much um, much more widespread. Like you have much more food. You have a white collar economy where more people are sitting all day doing their work. And so what differentiates you and makes you look kind of like superior or feel superior? Well, mm. look at me. I take care of myself. I, look at me. I can resist all of that fast food, which is everywhere these days. And so that's part of like this kind of exercise obsession and fitness obsession. And you see this, like, you know, I'm a historian, so I'm like such a geek with the sources. Like not only have I watched like every episode of Lelaine, but I've read all these books, like these early exercise books. And it's so interesting in like some of the early running books, like Jim Fix's book, which comes out in the late seventies, like the, which the complete book of running, which is like the book everyone reads. Mm. He is like so unapologetic about that sense of superiority. He's like, well, I had this friend, you know, he used to smoke oh. and drink and then he started swimming. And like now not only like is he have better heart health, but the best part is he walks down the street and he can just gloat looking at all of these deconditioned people and know how oh. he is. Yeah, it's like so unapologetic. He talks about people who he and some other people talk about, they use the term, the felony of inactivity. Like if you are wow. not physically active, you're basically a criminal. And like, I think we've moved away from that, thank goodness. But I do think that kind of attitude still exists. Like, you know, and I'm sure we're all a little guilty of it. Like when I finish like a long run and I'm like walking past all these people like having brunch, of course there's this like gross little part of me that's like, ha, huh, look what I did, you know? I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm not proud of that, but I do think that's a little bit part of a part of it. Enjoy your fries, ladies. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and I love fries. I'm not that big of a jerk. I, I promise you. I do I'm too. Not. But you're like self-loathing when you say it too. You're like, enjoy your fries. Right, right, right. No, but I think that moralizing is like yeah. so much part of the story that I'm trying to tell. Yeah. And I think like if we're not aware of it, we can't like see how damaging that can be. Like, you know, the Lelaine stuff, like it sucks that like women who already felt like they had this long to-do list are now like, oh my God, and I didn't do my leg lifts now. It's like another thing, even yeah. though exercise eyes can be so joyous and like it can be especially for women who were told for so long oh you can't do rigorous exercise like like i said your uterus will fall out you'll get muscles you'll look like a man like it's so great that women are encouraged to exercise i think the dicey thing is like when does that become like a pressure that you feel like oh i need to do this or i'm like unworthy or a bad person and when is yeah, it like right, a privilege right. like i get to move like this like you know what a blessing yeah, right. Have you ever read Kelly McGonigal's book, The Joy of Movement? I love her. Love her. Yeah, so she's much. great, right? Yeah. Um, and and that's the kind of thing where how do we bring joy to people through movement? Not not suffering, not self-flagellation. How do we bring just the understanding that the the movement is the joy? You just have to find what your joy is. And so many times people think oh, I'm supposed to do this because it burns more calories. I'm supposed to do this because it's supposed to do this for me. And really, what you're supposed to do is is just enjoy being active yeah. and find what that means for you. Right. Totally. And I think like you know, exercise science has evolved so much since like much of the 
period that I cover in the book. So we know so much more about like what's good for your heart, what's good for your muscles, like, you know, what's good for longevity, back pain, all the rest. At the same time, like you can know all that. And like, unless you enjoy on some level, the movement activities that you participate in, chances are you're probably not going to do them. So like right. when I am asked for advice and it's pretty simple, people are like, oh, well, what should I do? I'm like, you should start with like doing the thing you will do. And that the thing you will do is probably the thing you enjoy at least a little bit, you know, otherwise, right. like, you know, like it's really hard to motivate and like, is it really worth it to motivate to do something you absolutely despise well maybe not no that's all it's like uh and I, I just did a it was my first keynote presentation at oh. idea pti over the weekend so shout out idea thank you uh and i and i talked about sedentary behaviors and movement and and trying to inspire people to movement and I was like you know you either have to do the thing you like the most or hate the least right, right? <laughs> so right. dude man i can't think of anything i like and then you're like well what will you do that that you just you know, dislike the least and you'll start to, and just do the tiniest bit right, of it. Because right. if you told me, Rick, you have to floss your teeth for one hour every day. I don't like, I hate flossing my teeth. And so for some people like the gym, is that awful to them? Totally. But that's because there is a perception of supposed to's. There is a perception of if then, if I don't do this, then I will get this. I, you know, and 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 all I'm just trying to do right now is like, how can we change your behaviors, your perception, just in the smallest way to get you to enjoy doing something? Well, I think that that's really sharp. And I also think like this notion of enjoy is something we need to think about in more complicated terms or like more sophisticated terms than just like, this feels so good right now. Because you know what? Yeah, Sometimes yeah. exercise feels like that, but it's freaking hard. Like that's like kind of why it's worth it. Like, you know what feels good right now? Like, I don't know taking a nap, having an ice cream sundae. And like, sometimes those are like great things to do. But I also think like enjoy is related to, God, how do I feel when I stop running and like I have that rush? Like, how do I feel when I like nail a new dance step in some cardio class? How do I feel when I level up on my lifting and I like can add, you know, another couple of plates? Like all of that is hard to do, don't get me wrong, but I think we've got to think of enjoyment as not just like pure pleasure, but rather kind of like a broader definition of happiness. Sometimes it is pleasure. I agree. Like I love walking and jogging with a friend. That's like fun from the minute we hit, we head out the door we're just like chatting but like it's hard to like set up the freaking bar the deadlift it's so annoying i'm always dropping right the like, but then it feels really good to like build that strength and all that yeah. so you know enjoyment is not just pure pleasure i think yeah i tell people like there there are great movies out there that i really enjoy that 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 are entertaining that aren't funny yeah like sometimes they hurt sometimes they're sad like schindler's list a great movie I'm completely entertained by it yeah I, I mean that's not a feel good i mean there are parts of it that are feel good right but right. like it's you difficult. you yeah. do that because it, like you're you are involved yeah. you feel involved and and i think fitness can be that way or like learning an instrument or a new language it may not be fun in the moment right. your fingertips right. may hurt while pushing down a, a fret on a you know to play a chord but you're proud of right. what you've right. done you see progress you're working towards something to build this sense of like purpose and mastery and you know the Ryan and DG self-determination theory which is great uh, but but I want to get back to some of the things that we're talking about with the history stuff so yeah. let's do this I have several things I want to ask one is um I, probably this is more of a side note but I want it to be touched before we go into a deeper conversation so one is like presidential fitness award which oh, was yeah. around when I was a kid yeah. I, I don't know if it's around anymore uh, but I, think I would still like have to it. Speak to right it. yeah go okay ahead. I'm gonna write down your questions here Very but the though. more important one is so you you talked about the the very first guy what was his name that that you mentioned uh Sam Sander oh Sandow Eugene Sandow Sandow Sandow. Okay, so Sandow got some information out there probably by a flyer, mm -hmm. right? So, or you went to see the bearded lady and then he was on stage next to her, right? So, uh, you, it, but the way that it got out there is word of mouth and maybe a flyer, right? Uh, a poster that got put up. Jack LaLanne gets here, he's on television, 
Mm-hmm. And then Jack LaLanne, you move forward into um, more accessible television as we start to get cable and satellite and Arnold. And then you get uh, Jane Fonda and we have videotapes, mm-hmm. right? The VHSs. And then you get, and then you get, and now we're here where every single body that I want to see is right there on my phone. What is my fitness inspiration and how does that build into the obsession as you say Mm -hmm. and then what are some of the pros and cons absolutely so let me like back up for one second right there because you know sandow definitely had flyers and like you might go see him in person but you know what's really important in that whole period too is magazines so like and comic Ah. books and so like there might be a guy you've maybe heard of or some listeners have named bernard mcfadden like bernard with two r's he was like a super controversial person he was known as like a health nut because he was like obsessed with exercise he started something called physical culture city like in new jersey where like it was almost like a cult like everyone just exercised and ate healthy food all day now people pay a lot of money for that but um right. <laughs> he, he had all of these like exercise publications and a lot of people read those and they would in there you'd have people like sandow writing essays about you know how good it is for you to uh, exercise, et cetera. So that was really important. Um, and then interestingly, like Charles Atlas comes along not long ago. Yes. After. I think a lot of people will remember him. And um, of course. he's, you know, 97 pound weakling. Like there's this skinny guy on the beach. This is a comic walking with his girlfriend and like this big hulking guy kicks sand in his face. And then they edited the comic over years, but basically this little skinny guy is like so intimidated, but then he buys the Charles Atlas program and like now he can like defend his girl and like beat up this, this guy. And they, so they ad- advertise Atlas and uh, like some of these other folks advertised like these little pamphlets, like mail away books and like devices, basically like yeah. resistance bands, like maybe like very lightweights at that moment that you could send away fr- for. What's interesting about that like when you read all those sources is that like, yeah, it's promoting fitness, but the presumption, especially for men is that like, it's kind of embarrassing that you would even want to exercise. And so we'll sell oh. you this, we'll sell you this really inexpensive thing and you can do it in the privacy of your own home. Cause like, and so I think that is super important. It is so different from today. The like, Oh, uh, gym bro. Like, look at me, like going to the gym makes me like macho. It was considered like feminine to want to exercise because only women care about their bodies or gay men. And so there was a lot of like, like Charles Atlas had to like really like lay it on thick of like, yeah, you want to defend your girl? You got to work on your muscles because that was not assumed at all. Okay. So that's fascinating. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And by the way, Charles Atlas became first famous because Bernard McFadden, the guy with the magazines, used to run this contest. It was called like World's Most Perfectly Developed Man. And it was like so weird. It was in Madison Square Garden. They'd bring these doctors to like examine these people. And then Charles Atlas won, I think, two years in a row, 1922. McFadden's like, we're canceling the contest because no one will ever be more perfect than Charles Atlas. No (laughs) way. Yeah. That sounds like livestock though. Like yeah. let's bring oh, the, the vet in and look at the teeth and it's exact no, it's exactly like that. Even worse for the women. Like the way that the women were oh. examined is like even, even worse. And it's crazy. The only ones that are really positively, like they're only really, you can tell they're kind of like only positively described because they're white. Like it's very like, oh, she's like a perfect Bavarian woman, just like magnified. Like, and they talk about people of color very differently. Um, okay. Anyway, media. So you want to talk about where we are today? Yeah, I agree with your trajectory. Like, you know, TV, more TV, cable television, infomercials become a huge like link between TV and the home where like you're watching like 35 minutes at night being like, oh my God, if I buy that ab roller, I'm sure I'm going to do it. (laughs) I won't be sitting here. I'll be doing it. So you mail away for it. Um, And then, yeah, so basically you're asking about like where we are today. I mean, I think we're, we are awash in fitness, right? In every single media, whether it is like, you know, movies where people's bodies are like so insane on a level that they weren't before, like men's bodies in particular, like it's not even like a superhero, although the superheroes are something else. They're so much more muscular. Um, and so I think that's like shifting our ideal of what's supposed to be like desirable for sure. I mean, I don't know. In some ways, I think the like 
overwhelming amount of fitness media is positive because there is like free stuff and you can just have YouTube and your phone and be at home and do like some really amazing programs. I do think it's not great for a range of reasons. One, like the pressure, we really saw this in the pandemic of just seeing these so-called like perfect bodies and people working on themselves all the time can be so overwhelming and like cause so much insecurity and obsession and I think a really destructive way. So I think yeah. that is an issue. The other thing, and I would imagine it's probably like, I would imagine maybe like close to your heart as a professional and a PhD and someone, you know, who's invested in certification, like the total lack of control around expertise um, yeah. online is crazy, right? Like that's another, like I actually talk about the history of IDEA and some of the other certifying organizations oh, cool. in the book and the rise of like de the definition of personal trainer as a category too. But like one of the things that's always been a little complicated, I think with expertise in the fitness industry, it's like on the one hand, it's so great that there's a low barrier to entry and it's always been pretty low. I'm like being a doctor or a lawyer or anything like that. Like if you can like, like inspire people to work out, like you can probably get a job somewhere teaching fitness, right? Today, I do worry a little bit or a lot actually that online though, like some of the like, like, I don't know, the incentives are, are way off. Like if you have good lighting and great abs and you can talk about your journey, like you can have millions of people like following yeah. a program that might not be right for them. And like, I, that, that I find really troubling and, but I am divided because I, you know, it's really expensive to go get certifications yeah. and to do this. And like in a lot of other professions that's kept out a lot of people of color, poor people, marginalized folks, like there's something amazing about having that accessibility to be like, Hey, like, I know how to work out. I want to share that knowledge. And I think that that's really great. On the other hand, this is important work. These are people's bodies. This is their health. And like, I, I think it's like really troubling that like, you can just like look a certain way and be able to talk about like your personal experience and like people can get into a lot of trouble following that. So that's like kind of my mixed bag sense of like, you know, what the, what the internet and like all this fitness media is doing to us. Wow, this is so good, ladies and gentlemen. This is the NASMCBT podcast, and you, my guest Natalia Petrozella has, uh, I think, in such a wonderful way, like just going through with with energy and vitality, sharing this history of what you've learned, going through as a history professor, exploring what the culture around the obsession with fitness is. is. Is there a, um, are there any like, um, if you were to pull out some real integral, pivotal moments? Yeah. Uh, I would say Jack Lane would be a character, a moment unto himself. What are some maybe other moments that, that you're like, okay, that kind of shifted everything in a big way. Totally. Well, it actually answers one of your other points that I didn't get to talk about, which was the Presidential Council on <gasps> Fitness. Yay. So like I said, early on in the 20th century, like working out was seen as suspicious. Like it was sketchy. Like if you wanted to go to the gym, like you were weird. Like if you could even find a gym, <laughs> seriously. And then the Cold War comes along and specifically this wonderful woman named Bonnie Pruden who lives in the suburbs of New York. And it's a really, you know, like nice suburb in the 1950s. People have everything. The dads have desk jobs. People People have cars, TVs, and she's like, oh my God, we're living the American dream, but our kids are like deconditioned and lazy and, you know, they're not like moving at all. And she doesn't get a lot of attention for this discovery until she teams up with this doctor and they basically make the case that this is a national security emergency because we're not going to have huh. soldiers. And so they get oh. the, so I tell this whole Wait, story. Wait, really? Oh yeah, this is this is huge. This is As how the Presidential changes. Council on Youth Fitness gets formed. And so they go to the White House. I tell the whole story in the book, guys. Um, they go to the White wait. House and Eisenhower, who'd been a general, is like, oh my God, like we need to do something about this. So he puts Richard Nixon on the on the uh, on the job and he's like, Dick, we gotta do something about this. So he's like the first head of like this fitness group of people. Really? Like, yeah, yeah. And so the first council, it's established in 1956. It's called the Presidential Council on Youth Fitness. So it's only for okay. kids. But that is 
like it starts to introduce the idea that schools should invest in physical education. And then like, most importantly, they don't actually invest that much money in it, but it's like this sea change in, def- in, go- in exercise going from being defined yeah. as something that's like sketchy and weird and a waste of your time to being like, no, if you want to be a good American, you need to work out. And like, that is huge. And that like sensibility only wow. grows and grows and grows. And so that's a really big turning point. And then like kind of in that same vein, when Kennedy comes in right after Eisenhower, like he actually drops the youth from presidential council on youth fitness. And he's like, everybody needs to exercise. Gosh. And cause Kennedy's like young and cute. And like, he, he, he actually had a ton of health problems, but he like looks very athletic and he swam at Harvard and his family has all these beach houses. He kind of is like, I think like a, fitness influencer who's like, it's not just about the army guys, like working out is fun. And he has all these like sort of fun exercise activities, like girls do it, adults do it. So like he keeps expanding that. So that's a super important thing. And then the last thing that I'll say, which is very, very important, is um, there's this book that comes out in 1968. It's called Aerobics by Dr. Kenneth Cooper. Kenneth Cooper. I'm sure you know it. And it's confusing now because it's not aerobics like Jane Fonda aerobics. It's basically cardio. And he is like, oh, my God. Um, you know, we think of exercise as defined as basically two things, lifting weights and calisthenics. And he's like, we have got it all wrong. The thing that we should be doing is what he called aerobics. We should be swimming, biking, walking, jogging. Everybody should be doing this. This is like imperative for your health and like end of story. And that is an enormous sea change in how exercise is defined, but also in terms of like who's expected to participate in it. Like it went from like women being like, well, even if I wanted to work out, I don't want to like go to some weird gross place with all these barbells and these men. Um, And now it's like, well, ladies should be jogging too. And it actually can be not for building muscles, but it helps with weight management. And it's also good for these men with heart problems who have their three martini lunches and like so that like cardio revolution is like undeniable is like a huge huge turning point you wouldn't have aerobics and jazzercise and all those things if cardio hadn't been kind of introduced as something everybody should be doing so that's interesting because you look at the people today that that are older maybe in their 70s when kenneth cooper's book came out they were probably in their 30s Right. So this was this was a pivotal book that actually changed the way that so many people uh, age, like what their perception is. And I think the the longevity that people see. And this is this is my conclusion, is that because of Kenneth Cooper's book, I think it's such a pivotal book that Mm -hmm. that society here started seeing exercise differently Mm -hmm. and started incorporating it. And that could be one of the components of the increased longevity that we see. But obviously there there are, you know, drugs and, you know, healthcare in general that has also done that. But I'm going to give some credit to Kenneth Cooper. Oh, totally. Uh, Yeah. No, I mean, Uh, Yeah, go ahead, please. No, I think that's so important. And actually, like another thing I found so interesting in researching this book was kind of looking at the category of age as an identity category as it like relates to exercise. And something that Mm. I think is generally really positive is one, like, we know exercise and longevity are connected, right? So there's this like increased sense as exercise becomes more popular. It's not just for like the young and beautiful and like people who already look fit, but we've seen the expansion, what they call the graying of the gym, of the gym going demographic Uh to be people older and older. And I think that's really wonderful. And that can be like so great to like be able to feel better and, you know, have a good full life because you exercise more. There is like a flip side to it that I find really interesting. There's always a flip side. And I take this from um, Barbara Ehrenreich, who who died sadly last year, but she wrote this amazing book about longevity called Natural Causes. And she died, I think in her 70s. But she said, you know, I retired recently. And you know, she's sort of like upper middle class. And she says, and I realized that there is now this new expectation that after a life of like going to work every day, once I retire, I'm supposed to have a new job, go to the gym every day. And she's like, I didn't sign up for this. (laughs) And so I think like what this project kept me excited researching for so many years because like there's always that tension you know it's like empowering and amazing and I love the gym but there's also the like oh but it's this like pressure too so I think we got to just think through that oh this is amazing thank you thank you so much uh can you let everybody know 
uh, if there's a website they need to go to, the name of the book and how they can get it. Yeah. So the book is called Fit Nation, The Gains and Pains of America's Exercise Obsession. You can find it anywhere um, online. It's got a purple cover, yoga mat on the cover. And um, you can find me at nataliapetrozella.com or on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn at Natalia Petrozella. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. I greatly appreciate you being here. As always, keep inspiring people to fitness and encourage them and none of that stuff that that Jack LaLanne was slyly putting in there. So uh, we're here to empower people for that. If y'all want to reach out to me, you can do so. Hit me up at rick.richie at nasn.org or on Instagram at dr.rickrichie. Like, subscribe, share with your fitness friends and family. Thanks for listening. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.